So let us begin anew, remembering on both sides that civility is not a sign of weakness, and sincerity is always subject to proof. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. Now the trumpet summons us again, not as a call to bear arms, though arms we need, not as a call to battle, though embattled we are, but a call to bear the burden of a long twilight struggle, year in and year out, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. A struggle against the common enemies of man, tyranny, poverty, disease and war itself. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility, I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavour will light our country and all who serve it, and the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you but what together we can do for the freedom of man. This was John F. Kennedy, and this is the good, the bad, and the pure evil. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was born May 29, 1917, to Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., a businessman and politician, and Rose Kennedy, a philanthropist and socialite. The family was money. His grandfather's P.J. Kennedy was Massachusetts State Legislator, and John F. Honey Fitz Fitzgerald was a U.S. Congressman and two-term Mayor of Boston. All four of his grandparents came from Irish immigrants. John was one of nine children with siblings Joseph Jr., Rosemary, Kathleen or Kick, Eunice, Patricia, Robert or Bobby, Jean and Edward or Ted. Until he was 10, John lived in Brookline. His earliest memories were going with his grandfather Fitzgerald, touring historical sites in Boston, having discussions of politics over family dinners, both of which sparked his interest in history and politics. John's father would be a way off with business, which focused on Wall Street and Hollywood. In September 1927, the family moved from Boston to Riverdale, New York. Years later, while speaking to Look magazine, Robert would say they left because of discrimination, with signs stating no Irish need apply. The family vacationed in the summer in Hyannis Port and would swim, sail and play touch football. Christmas and Easter, they stayed in Palm Beach, Florida. September 1930, a then 13-year-old John was sent to Canterbury School, Connecticut. April 1931, John went under an apodectomy after this, he left school and returned home to recover. September 1931, John attended a boarding school named Choate. His older brother Joe was already there and was the star football player and an excellent student, a lot for John to live up to. John Doe went in a different direction, being more rebellious. He had a small group of friends who did pranks, one of which was blowing up a toilet seat with a firecracker. At an assembly following this, the headmaster would call who done it Muckers. From this, John decided to call his joker group the Muckers Club. The group included his roommate and lifelong friend Kirk Lemoy Lem Billings. In these school years, John was sick a lot. In 1934, doctors at Yale New Haven Hospital grew concerned that John might have leukemia. June 1934, admitted to Mayo Clinic in Rochester, they gave a final diagnosis of colitis, an inflammation of the colon that may be acute and self-limited or sometimes be long-term. John graduated June 1935 and was voted, voted most likely to succeed. September 1935, John traveled to London with his parents and sister Kathleen. 
He wanted to study at London School of Economics like his older brother had, but he became sick once again and was back in the US by October. He went to Princeton but left after two months due to a stomach ulcer. He recovered in Palm Beach and spent spring of 1936 working as a ranch, ranch hand outside Benson, Arizona. September 1936, he enrolled in Harvard. Here, he tried out for football, golf and swimming, ending up earning a spot in the swim team. John also sailed in the star class, which won the 1936 Nantucket Sound Star Championship. June 1938, John sailed overseas to his father to work at the American Embassy in London. John's father would be President Roosevelt's U.S. Ambassador to the Court of St. James. 1939, John toured Europe, Soviet Union, the Balkans and the Middle East. This was to help with his Harvard thesis. He then went on to Berlin and met with a U.S. diplomat representative, who gave him a heads up for his father of war soon breaking. John would continue on his travels to Czechoslovakia and then to London on September 1st, 1939, which was the day Germany invaded Poland, sparking World War II. Just two days later, speeches would happen in the House of Commons. The UK declared war on Germany. John was there to represent his father to help with arrangements for American survivors of the SS Athena. He then returned to the US. Back at Harvard, John took his studies more serious and became interested in political philosophy. 1940, he finished his thesis entitled Appeasement in Munich, which was based on the British negotiations during the Munich Ar Agreement. It would go on to be a bestseller entitled Why England Slept. John was in support of the US taking part in World War II, but his father would hold different beliefs that later would end his career as the ambassador to the UK. This would sour the relationship between the Kennedys and Roosevelt's. In 1940, John graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in the government, focusing on international affairs. John would go on to Stanford Graduate School of Business, but early 1941 left to help his father write a memoir about being the US ambassador. So John wanted to go to Yale School, but would decide against it when it looked more likely that the US was going into World War II. John tried in 1940 to enter the armies of Officer Cadet School. John would go through months of training, but would end up disqualified on medical grounds because of his chronic back problems. September 1941, Alan Kirk, Director of the Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI, helped join helped John join the U.S. Naval Reserves. By the October, John was an ensign, a junior rank officer, and he joined the staff of the Office of Naval Intelligence. January 1942, he was assigned to the head office in South Carolina and completed his training December 2nd. From there, he was assigned to the Motor Torpedo Squadron 4. He would first command PT-101, December 7, 1942 to February 23, 1943. PT stood for Patrol Torpedo Boat and was used for training. John would lead three Hunchkins PT boats from Melville to Jacksonville. While doing this, John ended in hospital for a while because he was in cold water on fouling a patroller for too long. After this, John was assigned in Panama, then the Pacific, where he would command two more PT boats. April 1943, John was on Motor Torpedo Squadron 2, taking command of PT-109. This was based in the Solomons. A dark and moonless night on August 1st to August 2nd, PTs were ordered to block four Japanese destroyers. John spotted the destroyer at around 2 a.m. They attempted to turn to attack, but the PT-109 was hit by the destroyer and was split into two. Two of the crew died, but 10 survived. In the water, John rallied the survivors. Do we fight or do we surrender? They chose to fight and swam nearly four miles to Plum Pudding Island. 
John actually told a badly burnt crew member through the water despite injuring his back in the hit. John even tried to swim to hail a passing American PT boat to get his crew rescued. April 4th, 1943, John and executive officer Lenny Tom helped the crew, now hungry and injured, to Oslana. In strong currents again, John would tow the badly burnt man. John and Ensign Ross on August 5th swam over an hour to look for help and food. They found the canoe with supplies left by the Japanese. John would paddle this back to the hungry crew. By August 7th, a message to Ben Kinuve would se- send to Lieutenant Evans. Evans got word to the PT base in Rendova. Lieutenant Bud Liebnow, a friend of John's, would rescue John and the crew on August 8th, 1943. John would be laid up for only a month from the accident. He would now command PT-59. October 8th, 1943, John was promoted to full lieutenant. November 7, John's PT-59 would successfully rescue about 50 Marines. The 59 shielded them from shore fires as the Marines escaped to a landing craft. Come November 18, John's doctors ordered him to be relieved of command and he was sent to the hospital in Tulagi. January 1944, he was back in the US. He would receive treatment for his injury on his back and by late 1944, was released from active duty. Back in the US, John spent from May to December 1944 in Chelsea Naval Hospital. June 12, John received the Navy and Marine Corps Medal for his heroics on the August 1st, 2nd, 1943. He was also awarded the Purple Heart Medal. January 1945, John spent another three months at Castle Hot Springs to continue his recovery and then went on to a military hospital in Arizona. Now John felt his medal for heroism was not combat and wanted it to be recognized and so asked for the Silver Star Medal to be rewarded. He was told he was going to get this, but this didn't come true. John's father even requested for the Silver Star to be awarded to his son. August 12, 1944, John's brother Joe Jr a naval pilot sadly was killed during a special operation. Joe volunteered for the mission. His explosive laden plane exploded when the bomb on board detonated early. March 1945, John retired from the Navy. He was honorably discharged with full lieutenant rank. John wasn't given the Silver Star, but in 1950, the Department of the Navy offered a compromise of the Bronze Star as some sort of recognition for his service. But John didn't accept it, possibly insulted with the offer. So John's father knew a lot of people, including William Randolph Hearst, owner of Hearst Communication. John's father managed to get John a job at Hearst newspaper as a special correspondent in April 1945. This benefited in two ways. One, to keep John's name in the public and two, to see if John wanted a career in journalism. John's older brother, Joe, was the one for the big plans created by his father. John's father always said Joe was going to be president one day. Not could be, but was going to be. Joe sadly died in 1944. This didn't end their father's dream of a son as president. He just readjusted his expectations onto the next eldest boy, John and so the course of presidency was now for John to achieve. With John's father's nudge, James Michael Curley, US representative, left the seat becoming mayor of Boston in 1946. With his father's money back, John ran his campaign and won the Democratic primary. While campaigning, he spoke what the people wanted to hear. He called for better housing for vets, better health care for everyone, reasonable work hours, healthy workplaces, the right to organize, bargain and strike. He also won the peace through the UN and he was strongly against the Soviet Union. John would serve in the House for six years being part of the Education and Labour Committee and the Veterans Affairs Committee. His main focus was on international affairs. 
He wasn't very vocal when it came to the anti-communist subjects, but through his support behind the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, which made it law that communists had to register with the government. Richard Nixon was John's opponent, and between September and October they squared off against each other in the first ever televised presidential debates. The TV debate didn't make Nixon look good. He had an injured leg, appeared unshaven, he was sweating under the lights, and overall looked uncomfortable and tense. John, on the other hand, looked fresh, relaxed and confident, making him look strong and a winner. Now, it was also broadcast on the radio. To those listening on the radio, they found Nixon the better of the two. Listeners had Nixon stronger and clearer in a debate. This would be a milestone in history becoming a moment when TV began to play a dominant role in politics. After the debate, John started to pull ahead in most polls. John would win in one of the closest elections of the 20th century. John would become the youngest president ever elected to presidency. Technically, Roosevelt was the youngest president at 42 when he automatically became president after the assassination of William McKinley in 1901. But John was the youngest elected by the people. January 20th, 1961, John F. Kennedy was sworn in as the 35th president. His address was strong and confident. His early years in office were tough, trying to manage daily political realities at home and abroad. John would immediately scrap Eisenhower's methods. John's organisational approach was of a wheel, with all the spokes leading back to the president. John wanted a mix of people in his cabinet, ones who had experience and ones without, all learning their jobs together. John's foreign policy was dominated by American confrontations with the Soviet Union. In 1961, John misinterpreted a speech of Soviet Nikita Khrushchev. The speech was intended for a domestic audience in the Soviet Union, but John took it as a personal jab. His misunderstanding had tensions high going to Vienna summit in June 1961. John would get advice from French President Charles de Gaulle to ignore Khrushchev's approach. But June 4th, John left a meeting with Khrushchev in Vienna and felt bullied by him. Khrushchev thought John was intelligent but weak. John did succeed proposing a treaty between Moscow and East Berlin, but made it clear if they interfered with the US success and rights in West Berlin, it would be seen as an act of war. John returned to the US, and the USSR announced it would sign the treaty with East Berlin. But no third party would hold rights in either sector of the city, like the US. John was livid and felt he had no option but to prepare for nuclear war, which he really believed could happen. Weeks from the Vienna summit, 20,000 fled East Berlin into West. John began intense meetings on the Berlin issue. July 1961, he added $3.25 billion to the defense budget, along with 200,000 troops, stating an attack on West Berlin was an attack on the US. A month later, Soviet Union and East Berlin started to block passages for East Germans into West Berlin. They had a barbed wire fence, which soon became the Berlin Wall. John at first ignored this, but confidence of the US was being lost, so he sent Vice President Johnson and military personnel to convoy through East Germany, including through Soviet checkpoints, to to show the US commitments to West Berlin. The Eisenhower administration had a plan set up to overthrow Fidel Castro in Cuba. The plan was to invade with a counter-revolutionary insurgency that had the US train anti-Castro Cuban exiles. The aim was to invade and set up an uprising amongst the Cuban people. This they hoped would have Castro removed. John was on board and on April 14, 1961, he approved the final plan. The Bay of Pigs invasion hit the ground April 17, 1961. 
1,500 U.S. trained Cubans called Brigade 2506 landed on the island. There was no air support. New CIA Director Alan Dulles would later explain that once troops were on the ground, he believed John would approve action if needed. But April 19, 1961, the Cuban government had killed or captured all these exiles, and John was forced into negotiations. Twenty months later, Cuba let them all go for $53 million of food and medicine. This would have Castro a bit cautious of the states, and he was convinced another invasion was coming. So the Bay of the Pigs was a flop, and John felt very much set up to look like a fool. He would have Robert and a committee set up to examine what went wrong. Late 1961, the White House formed a special group augmented, headed by Robert. Their aim was to take Castro down using covert tactics. The summer of 1962, the administration continued with a plan to invade Cuba. October 14, 1962, CIA spy planes took photos of Soviets constructing missile sites in Cuba. These photos were then shown to John. From the photos, the agreement was it posed a serious immediate nuclear threat. So John had a decision to make. If the U.S. attacked, it could spark a nuclear war with the USSR. But if the U.S. did nothing, that held the threat of close-range nuclear hits. John was also pretty sore about the remarks made of Khrushchev from the Vienna summit. U.S. National Security Council were leaning on an unannounced aerosol on the site, but some felt this would create another Pearl Harbor in reverse. Some also believed it was hypocritical considering that the US had placed Jupiter missiles in Italy and Turkey in 1958. A bit of a pot kettle moment. With all this to consider, John chose a naval quarantine. October 22nd, John sent a message to Khrushchev and went on TV to announce his plans. So from October 24th, the US Navy started to inspect Soviet ships that came to Cuba. John sent two more letters to Khrushchev, but nothing came from them. The UN called for a cooling off period between the two. Khrushchev actually agreed, but John did not. October 28, Khrushchev agreed to dismantle the sites and that the UN could inspect. The US publicly said that they would not invade Cuba and secretly removed their missiles in Italy and Turkey. This whole crisis had the world closer to nuclear war than ever before or after. It's thought that the humanity of Khrushchev and John came true. This crisis would strengthen John's image and his credibility. John wanted to contain the threat of communism in Latin America. To do this, he had to set up the Alliance for Progress. This wanted greater human rights for all and would send aid to countries. The Eisenhower administration through the CIA began making plans to assassinate Castro and also Rafael Tiligo of the Dominican Republic. When John took office, he would quietly tell the CIA whatever the plan was, it must show plausible deniability by the US. In the June of 1961, the Dominican Republic leader was assassinated. Days later, Chester Bowles, the Under Secretary of State were given a cautious reaction, so cautious that Robert, to his face, called him a gutless bastard. One of John's first acts as president was setting up the Peace Corps. The director was his brother-in-law, Shiver. The program organized American volunteers to help developing nations in education, farming, health and construction. By 1961, over 200,000 Americans had joined the Peace Corps. While a congressman in 1951, John was very interested in Vietnam. Then, as a U.S. Senator, in 1956, he would publicly call for the U.S. to do more and be more involved in Vietnam. He wanted communism to be defeated, especially in Vietnam. Eisenhower would say Los was the head communist in threat. In May, John said Johnson to speak to South Vietnam President Diem. Johnson promised him more aid to fight against communists. 
John would announce a change of policy from support to a partnership with DiEM to rid South Vietnam of communism. The Viet Cong would start to be a dominant force in late 1961. A mission in October would have the presidential advisor General Maxwell D. Taylor advising John to send 8,000 US troops to Vietnam. By late 1963, John said 16,000, but John refrained from a full-scale development. John didn't want the Vietnamese people thinking or feeling that the US was the region's new colonizer. But March 8, 1965, John's successor, President Lyndon Johnson, would escalate forces to 184,000. Late 1961, John sent Roger Hillsman to assess the Vietnam situation. He met with the British advisory Thompson, and together they formed the Strategic Hamlet Program. Both John and DiEM approved this. Early 1962 was implemented, but by November 1963 the program began to wane, and by 1964 it was done. 1963 John was in another tough situation. He knew the US hadn't a hope staying in Vietnam, but couldn't give up the area to communists if he wanted to be re-elected re in the US. August 21st, US amb Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. arrived. He was to get Diem and his brother Nu to step down and leave Vietnam. Diem wouldn't have it. August 24th, Washington declared they wouldn't put up with Nu's antics and Lodge was to get Diem to remove Lu. Lodge would advise the only way to achieve this was to get the generals to overthrow Diem and Nu. But back at the White House, John was getting different stories. He spoke to General Krulak, who said all was progressing well. But State Mendenhall told John all was lost. John didn't know who to believe and wasn't aware that these two had issues, so much so they never spoke on the return flight. To figure out what was happening, John sent Defense Mac uh, Secretary McNamara and General Maxwell Ta Taylor. They met with DM, who refused an agreement. This would confirm the idea that the military was not succeeding. John asked for a report scheduling withdrawals of troops, completing it by 1965. October messages came of a coup against DM's government. The source was Vietnamese General Mi, also called Big Mi. He wanted to know the US position. John gave Lodge the go-ahead to offer help, but no assassination. November 1st, 1963, South Vietnamese generals with Big Me overthrew the government, arrested Diem Anu and killed him. When word came of this to John, he was completely shocked. This coup gave confidence back in the idea that war could be won. A national security action memo would be drafted for John ready for him once he returned from Dallas. It's been said increasing the military and aid would have been the option he would take in. We don't know if John would have escalated because he would sadly be assassinated in Dallas. It's been suggested John was going to pull out of Vietnam once he won the 1964 elections. But at the time of his death, no final decision was made. Johnson would disagree with the pullout of troops, and once he took over as president, he signed the NSAM 273, reversing the decision to withdraw the thousand troops. While president, John travelled a lot. June 1963, he went to West Germany and West Berlin. He gave a speech in West Berlin on June 26. He wanted to make it clear the US commitment to Germany, criticising communism. The speech was met with excitement. It is known for a famous phrase, Ich bin in Berlin. I am resident of Berlin. As president, John created security ties with Israel. He is credited as the founder of the US-Israeli military alliance. He described the protection of Israel as not only moral, but national commitment. John was the first to introduce the idea of special relationships between the US and Israel. 
In 1963, John was the first U.S. president to allow the sales of advanced U.S. weapons to Israel and provide diplomatic support, which was not seen so great to their Arab neighbors. This would also cause tension within the Israeli government over the creation of a nuclear materials in Dimona. They believed it would spark a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. John would write to the Israeli first prime minister, saying the nuclear program had to be forthcoming. He would say all was being developed peacefully. But this wasn't exactly true. When inspections were being done by American scientists, areas would be temporarily shut down to mislead them. They also had to give a lot of notice to visit and have full permission of the Israel government to do so. Documents would show that John's administration was concerned, and while John understood the US couldn't go around telling others what they could or couldn't do, he wasn't impressed knowing Israel was using Dimona for production of plutonium. March 1965, word came that Israel was indeed developing nuclear weapons. May 1968, President Johnson was told that Dimona was making enough plutonium for two bombs a year. From Berlin in 1963, John went to Ireland for four days. Here he held speeches, meetings, and he also was given the freedom of Wexford, Cork, Dublin, Galway and Lipperick. John was the first foreign leader to address the House of the Oireachtas, which is the Irish Parliament. John would say these were the four best days of his life. July 1963, John sent W. Everell Harriman to Moscow to try to get a treaty agreement with the Soviets. It was to agree on a nuclear test ban. The Soviets were very reluctant to agree to allow inspections. Eventually, the US, UK and Soviet Union signed a limited treaty. This prohibited atomic testing on ground, in the atmosphere, underwater or underground. The U.S. Senate ratified this and in October 1963, John signed it into law. Back home, John had a program called New Frontier. It had high aspirations to give federal funding for education, medical care to the elderly, economic aid and government intervention to stop or slow the recession. He also aimed to end racial discrimination. At his State of Union address in 1963, he put a proposed tax reform, reduction in income tax rates and in, in, in corporate tax rates as well. Congress passed only a few of John's major programs during his lifetime. John strongly supported racial integration and civil rights. When Martin Luther King was jailed for his part at a department store sit-in, John called King's wife Coretta to check in and give her support. Robert actually got King released from prison, adding the black support to John's campaign in 1960. In his first year in office, John appointed many African Americans to office, including True Good Marshall. Although supportive, John's participation was seen a bit lukewarm, especially regarding the Freedom Riders. They organized an integrated public transport effort in the South. The group were met with a white mob violence, which included law officers and federal. John would use federal marshals to protect the group. Robert would try to speak to the group to come off the bus and allow the courts to deal with the matter peacefully. John didn't want to send federal troops. He feared it would increase tensions and hatred. March 1961, John signed Executive Order 10925. This would cover employment. The employees are treated fair regardless of race, color, or national origin. Martin Luther King Jr. was not impressed with the speed John was dealing with segregation. He wrote to him in 1962, calling him to create a second emancipation proclamation. John did not execute such an order. September 1962, African-American student named James Meredith enrolled at the University of Mississippi, but he wouldn't be allowed to enter. Robert Kennedy, who was the Attorney General, sent 127 marshals and 316 Border Patrol, along with 97 Federal Correctional Affairs, to the scene. 
The result was I'll Miss Riot, 1962. This would have two dead and hundreds injured. Robert had no choice but to send 3,000 troops to end the riot. James was eventually allowed to enroll in a class and John would regret sending troops, not sending troops earlier. November 20th, 1962, John signed Executive Order 11063. This meant racial discrimination in federal supported housing was no longer allowed. But not all followed this law. One such was the Boston Housing Authority Board, who continued to segregate the public housing developments until 1968. Both John and his brother Robert were concerned about King's suspected ties to communists Jack O'Dell and Stanley Levinson. John would speak to his civil rights expert Harrison Wolford and he said that both men should resign from the SCLC. King would agree but only to one, O'Dell. He wanted to keep Levinson as he believed Levinson could be trusted. Early 1963, John related to King's thoughts on the idea of civil rights legislation. His brother Robert would advise John to take a stance on the legislative front. June 11, 1963, John would intervene when George Wallace, Alabama governor, blocked the doorway of the University of Alabama to prevent two African American students attending. The students were Vivian Malone and James Hood. Wallace would move, but only when confronted by Deputy Attorney General Kazenbach and U.S. National Guard, which were ordered by President Kennedy. That evening, John spoke on TV and radio regarding the report to the American people in civil rights. Here he aimed to provide equal access to public schools along with other facilities. He also aimed a greater protection of voting rights. This would become part of the Civil Rights Act that came in 1964. That evening, the NAACP, Magdar Evers, was sadly killed outside his home. August 28, 1963, the Civil Rights March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom happened. John was concerned that this would affect the Civil Rights Bill, so he decided not to accept the invitation to speak. But he did help. To make sure all went well, the organizers and John edited speeches that could have been infla inflammatory. They also agreed that the march should be happening on a Wednesday and be over by 4 p.m. Troops would be placed on standby. John watched the speech and was very impressed with King. No, not one person was arrested relating to the demonstration. Those leaders involved were invited to the White House afterwards. John felt the march was a victory for him and strengthened the chances for the Civil Rights Bill. But it was far from over or solved. Just three weeks later, September 15th, a bomb went off at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. Four African American children were killed and two others shot to death in the aftermath. Because of such violence, the civil rights legislation went through dramatic amendments, which would look like the bill wouldn't pass. John was outraged. He called congressional leaders to the White House the next day the original bill would be passed. The legislation was enacted after John's assassination, enforcing voting rights, public accommodations, employment, education, and administration of justice. In February 1962, J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, wasn't too keen on Martin Luther King. He seen him as a troublemaker and would give the Kennedy's administration allegations that some of King's associates were communists. The FBI would monitor King for the next few months. Robert and John would warn King to cut ties from these associates, but he wouldn't. So Robert gave the okay to the FBI to wiretap King and others in October 1963. Robert only okayed a trial of a month for the wiretaps, but Hoover extended it until June 1966 and this wasn't revealed until 1968. The Apollo program would come about in 1960. As a senator, John was opposed and wanted the space program terminated. 
Early in his presidency, he was set to dismantle the manned space program, but postponed the decision as Johnson strongly supported it. John's advisors were concerned about the costs, and John once again planned to dismantle because of this. This changed April 12, 1961, when news came that the Soviet cosmonaut became the first person to fly in space. This would have Americans fear being left behind in the technology competition with the Soviet Union. John really wanted the US to win the space race for reasons of national security and prestige. John's advisor, Tent Sorosan, advised him to support the moon landing. May 25th, John announced the goal with a speech. After this, Congress approved funding. November 21st, 1962, a meeting with NASA would have John explain the moonshot was important and expenses were justified. Cost for the Apollo program was expected to be $40 billion. September 1963, before the UN, John requested cooperation before, between the Soviets and America in space. Khrushchev would decline this. The Soviets did, didn't man, um, man the moon mission until 1964. July 20th, 1969, six years after John's death, Apollo 11 landed the first manned spacecraft on the moon. Friday, 22nd November, 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. He was there on a political trip, traveling in his president in motorcar. Through Dallas, he was shot once in the back and once in the head. He was rushed to Parkland Hospital but just 30 minutes after arriving, he was pronounced dead. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was just 46 years old when he died. Lee Harvey Oswald, who worked at the Texas School Book Depository, where it's believed the shots came from, was arrested for the murder of John F. Kennedy. Oswald denied any involvement, crying out that he was a patsy. Sunday, November 24th, detectives were escorting Oswald through the basement of the Dallas Police Headquarters. At 11.21 a.m., Jack Ruby came out at Oswald from the side of a crowd and shot Oswald dead. He'd be taken to Parkland Hospital and was confirmed and pronounced dead at 1.07 p.m. Ruby was arrested, convicted, appealed and won. But he became ill and died January 3rd, 1967, of cancer, while he was waiting a new trial date. The Warren Commission was cre created to investigate the assassination. It would state Oswald acted alone and wasn't part of any conspiracy. Many dispute the investigation and findings. John's funeral took place November 25th, 1963, at Cathedral of St. Matthew the Apostle. John is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. The honor guard at his gravesite was the 37th cadet class of the Irish Army. His grave is lit with an eternal flame. John Kennedy and William Howard Taft are the only two presidents buried here. John's president and political life was full of peaks and valleys, and his personal life was much the same. His family was one of the most established political families in America. Within the family was a president, three senators, three ambassadors, and multiple politicians, both federal and state level. His younger brother, Robert, or Bobby, would play a major role in John's career. Bobby would run for president in 1968, but he too was assassinated. John's brother, Edward, or Ted, ran in 1980, but lost. John would come third in the Gallup's list of widely admired people of the 20th century. John met his wife, Jacqueline Jackie Bouvier, when he was a congressman. They married September 12, 1953. They sadly had a miscarriage in 1955 and a stillborn in 1956 they named Arabella. 1957, they finally had a daughter, Carolyn, and then a son, John F. Kennedy Jr. in 1960. John Jr. sadly died in 1999 when his plane crashed en route to Martha's Vineyard. The couple also had a son in 1963 they called Patrick, but due to complications, he only lived for two days.
John and Jackie were young compared to other president couples and both were popular in the media. They were influential, fashionable and role models. Jackie would bring fresh new modern decor to the White House. She'd invite artists, writers and intellects to the White House. The Kennedys would also have a swimming pool and tree house at the White House. John Doe was always ill with something. Through his childhood, he had whooping cough, chicken pox, measles, ear infections. At three, he had scarlet fever, ending up in hospital. At 30, he was diagnosed with Addison's disease. The White House physician, Dr. Travell, revealed in 1966 he also had hypothyroidism. Along with this, he had chronic back pain, which he had surgery for. During his presidential years, he had high fevers, stomach issues, colon and prostate issues, abscesses, high cholesterol, and adrenal problems. He would be on a battery of pills, injections, and treatments to control the pain, discomfort, weight loss, infection, and to help him sleep. Within his family, death and tragedy was high. I've spoken about the sad losses of his babies. His older brothers, Joe, died in World War II, and spoken about his younger brother, Robert, untimely death by assassination. But tragedy and death also hit other family members. John's sister, Rosemary, had intellect disabilities. She had a lumbotomy, which left her incapacitated for the rest of her life. Another death was that of his ki- sister, Ka- uh, Kathleen Kick, who died in a plane crash in 1948. Because of these premature deaths, accidents, assassinations and other tragedies linked to the family, there is a thought that they are cursed, not only the Kennedy family, but their friends, associates and relatives. John was a fun-loving guy, charming, powerful, but he was no saint and had a bit of a wandering eye. In the Senate, he had an affair with Gillian von Post. She would claim John was going to end his marriage to be with her before he had children. He's also suspected to have affairs with Marilyn Monroe, Judith Campbell, Mimi Alford, and even his press secretary's wife. The relationship with Monroe is very unclear. It's reported they spent a weekend away at Bing Crosby's home in March 1966. Switchboard operators at the White House would note Marilyn Moreau would call in in 1962. J. Edgar Hoover got reports about John's secret activities. One such report was about an East German spy, Ellen Rumschnick. But Jack actually believed the friendly, easygoing relationship he had with the press would protect him regarding exposing the secrets of his personal life. John's assassination rocked not only the US but the whole world. His death happened live on TV and many can tell where they were and when they heard the news. Many of his speeches are considered iconic. Despite a short term in office, John is considered by many as the top of the presidents. Some of his inaugural speech is engraved on a plaque at his grave. In 2018, the Times published an audio recreation of the watchmen on the walls of the world freedom. This speech was the one he was supposed to deliver in Dallas in 1963. In 1963, after his death, John was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. In the words of John F. Kennedy, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest form of appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. Thank you all for listening. Next time I'll be looking at the Minamata Bay disaster and disease caused by the release of methyl mercury in the industrial wastewater from a chemical factory. It affected the fish and shellfish, which was then eaten by the people, resulting in mercury poisoning. It all began to come out when the cats went crazy and were falling into the sea, which at first the people of Minamata area thought the cats had become depressed and were committing suicide. Little did they know what was coming their way. Until then, this was the good, the bad and the pure evil.